Pete Calandra here. Today's video is my weekly vlog detailing the progress of my current ESPN film project. As in the other episodes of this series, I'm going to focus in on the music as I cannot show the film or dialogue at this stage of the work. I'm also going to go through the score section by section, and as a bonus towards the end of the blog, I was able to use the new Spitfire Audio Symphonic Motions Library on the last queue that I was able to finish this week. There'll be timestamps in the show notes and also in a pinned comment for each section. If you like this video, give a thumbs up. For more content, please subscribe and to be notified, ring that bell. Please leave any comments or questions below. Thanks for watching and let's get right into it. As in the previous three videos, I'm using the same template, which contains sounds from Orchestral Tools, Spitfire Audio, Heaviosity, Spectrosonics, and Native Instruments. I made sure that I went through the first act and created a rough score that I could refer back to. As there's quite a bit of content in the first act, I can reuse these themes, reorchestrated different keys, different moods, change the pitch register of the melody, different feels, and develop that through the course of the film. And that'll give a unity and consistency to my score. So the second act of this film contains some darker moments, some low moments in this person's life. I wanted to prepare for that. The opening scene is a couple of still shots of the athlete in a very large arena. It's kind of an etherealness and mood to that that I wanted to capture. And I wanted to prepare for some of the darker moments. So I started off with this drone sound from Vocalese 2 by Heaviosity, and it's just a pedal point on an E-flat. Now, this is a really interesting sound, but since I'm going to have some other music above that, which is also choir sounds, I needed to do some treatment to it. So, as you can see here, I put a low-pass filter on it. Let me take the low-pass filter off and play the sound. And you can see that there's a lot of high-frequency content there those upper harmonics will clash with what I'm writing here, so I got rid of them. This is just a very simple. Using one of the soloists in Heaviosity 2, a very simple choir, starting off very simple on the fifth of E flat. And just going up to the tonic through the sixth and then doing a reverse pyramid of adding voices. This B flat actually sustains all the way through and then ending on the fifth again. Whoops, let's listen to that. What I've also done to that choir sound is I've layered these Eric Whitaker Evos, and you can hear the vowels changing as the note sustains, which adds a really nice feel. And then when you combine the two choir sounds, It's very simple writing, and I'm just underscoring the beginning of that. There's a couple of photo changes that I've hit with these low ethnic drums. This is also from Heaviosity, from their ethnic ensembles, ethnic drum ensembles. All right, so that whole little bit once again. One thing I want to point out right in this area here, notice I've left a little breath, okay, because I want to make it sound human and they can't sing that long. And also adds to the phrasing. And what's nice is that the space that it's in, the reverb, the ambience fills in this spot 
I needed to start at this particular SMPTE point. So what I had to do was figure out how to change that. So I added a bar of 2.4 and I changed the tempo here to 80. Now this film is not going to have any live players on it. They don't have the budget and I just know how things are going to work. I've explained that in previous episodes of this. So right here, we're going to change and the athletes at college, the filmmakers wanted positive, refreshing, something strong. And what did I do here? I brought in something from the first act, which is these marimbas and the house. So those chords and that rhythm, and I varied them a little bit, and they are going against this pedal point on the piano, which is the Native Instruments Noir. And there's my harmonics going through those echoes, which I've had in the last two episodes. And then right here in the first act, I've got these wood blocks during the opening titles uh, where they've got the graphics. And so I brought them back here. And then this industrial hit is a sound that I recorded in the hallway of my old New York City apartment that I use. And I've got that going through the Pro R1 and the Wet Reverb. There's some photo changes going on there and this is a nice transition into the little melody. And this is a variation on something from the first act again. So let's look at how I've constructed this phrase. So I've got this short phrase here, and it ends on an ascending figure. And then the second time through, right? We have a descending figure, then a repeat of the first phrase, and then the second one is a little bit longer than the corresponding one in the first measure, and it leads us back into the downbeat, which is something in my style that if you've been following this vlog, I love to lead into the downbeat. And that's a variation on something from the first act, and that's with the aperture spiccato from Spitfire Audio. And then I've also got this really cool wood kalimba, which is found in Omnisphere. Just to give a little percussive, a pitched percussive. And I've taken a lot of the low end out of this because it is too huge. It needs to fit in with the other instruments. which this is Easy Drummer, who I didn't mention before, but I'm using the action drums here, the kick drum from that. And I've got a shaker. So this is just marking time. There's some, a lot of talking going on over this. There's a bunch of pictures changing. And the music needs to just drive the scene along without getting in the way of the dialogue, really. If I was changing key constantly, if I had like a lot of melodic content going on, things that get in the way of the dialogue, it wouldn't really work. And then after... All right, so I just changed the feel here. I haven't changed the chord yet. I changed the feel. The strings go up an octave or two, and I change the patch to the Albion strings. So that's a kind of nice figure. It's just a straight 16th note pattern going through. Right? It's a two-note, uh, two-measure phrase. I like that a lot. I love the second second measure, these leaps up here. That's the kind of thing you'd find in Chopin etude in C-sharp minor, except 10 times faster. <laughs> and then there's the vocalist, soloist. This is from Vocalese 2. And as I've mentioned in the previous episodes, the filmmakers want female voices in this. And this is the best way for me to get it, given the budget of this project.
So again, this all this music is just moving forward, pushing the story forward, giving a beat and energy, but not getting in the way. But notice how I change the orchestration every little section. The first time through, the kick drums on two and four. One, two, three, four. And then when it changes here, you get the boom, the doom, the doom, the doom in the kick drum. And then I jump the strings up an octave, or it's actually two octaves, and then the voice comes in over here. And then now the drums drop out here. We've got this really cool interlocking rhythm. Let's listen to this. And that's uplifting. Piano figure goes up, right? You've got this ascending line here, but nothing too much to get in the way of the dialogue. And then there's this choral pad here. And again, this is supposed to be uplifting, so my lines go up. It's very simple. And then we have a new little section here. Uh, so I've changed the patterns. Let's take a listen to the rhythmic section here. Transition from the previous one. Let's take a look at these, all in notation. Right, so notice this. And then these eighth notes here. And then the syncopated rhythm here. Three, four, one, tick, 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 right? So you got that 16th note anticipation of that. For an F minor, this is a C sharp, but it's really a D flat. Let me make that bass note. There we go. That's really cool. It's the Hauschka prepared piano samples from Spitfire, which I'm using quite a bit in the score. It's just on the low note there. We've got some pizzicato strings from the Neo strings by Spitfire and then some Colenio. So let's listen to how all of the interlocking rhythms sound. So we've got the noir, the piano, the marimba, and the house rhythm. So it's kind of like a cross between a funky groove with a backbeat and then sort of Steve Reichian with the orchestration between all the pitched percussion. And let's see if I do this, this, and this. We can take a look at that in notation. I love writing music like that. It just, it's really cool. I have so much fun writing interlocking rhythms like that. All right, so now we're going to, we're coming to a little pause in the action. Oh, I forgot. There are also some bass instruments here. There's a cello and an upright bass. And then this spacey music that bridges us over to the next section. Kepler winds. It's just a polyrhythm that I programmed from that. 
And then I've got this pad here. And with this, I've done some volume work probably in, yep, if we look here, we can see the MIDI volume going up. 23, 36. So I've done some volume automation there so that it swells in. And then we've got a soloist. Right, so it's playing now. I didn't like that first part of the phrase and how it fit in, so I just muted it with MIDI volume. You can see that the MIDI volume is zero here. And then I got the phrase that I wanted by bringing up the MIDI volume. That's a little trick that I've, I do sometimes. All right, let's go ahead to the next section. Things get a little bit more dramatic here. I've taken the 7-8 phrase from the, and I've made it a little bit simpler here. So we've got just this marimba. So I've got that broken up into two groups of two. One, two, one, two, one, two, three. The first time through, we were doing one, two, three, one, two, one, two in the first act. That's how I broke up the seven. What I've done is I've combined the way that the lower the bass notes accent. They're three, two, two. So and that's going against the two, two, three subdivision of the marimba. And I've got just these pizzicato notes here, just pedal pointing that F sharp. I've done a variation, not only in the orchestration, but in the feel, but it's still relatable back to the first act because it's the same bass line. And we're in a different key now. We were in E minor the first time, now we're in F sharp. And again, we have a little transition section here. I had to make four eighth notes here in order to get it to line up to a picture change right here. So just add it in, extra four eighth notes. And I use that as a pivot to go to the next section. And I've changed the orchestration more. Added these Colenio strings, which give us a little percussive. is still moving in the same pattern as before. And then I'm doubling the bass in fifths now with these low winds from Iceni, uh, from the Iceni Library by Spitfire. So using orchestration to build up the tension. And notice that there's not a lot of melodic content here in any register that anyone is speaking in. Another little transition section here in 9-8 with some drum hits. And again, changing key again right here, and we're back in 4-4. Four, four. We've got the choir, and we've got this muted piano. Doubling the marimba. So here we are at the beginning of the second cue of Act 2, and this first little bit here, I'm going to have to do a little bit more work on and make it a little bit more dramatic. They like the overall feel of it, but they just want some bigger, more dramatic hits, I believe. But I'll be working on that on Monday. So let's take a listen. Mm -hmm. 
That is a baritone guitar. Let's solo that. And that's some Omnisphere with some tweaks to it. Yep, got that going through this Benson program that is in the Echo Boy Jr. And then I've done something really cool here, I think. I've got this Ocarina, which is from the Andy Finden kit bag. And what I've done with this is I've panned it completely to the left. Right? It should be coming out of your left ear. So I've added some Pro R reverb. I have a mono delay track that I've added. And let's see what I've done. So this is the EP34 from UA. And I've panned this all the way to the right. And I've added a little Moog filter to this to cut off some of the high end and add some drive. And then I've sent that signal, a portion of that, out through the wet reverb from New Neighbor. So let's listen to that now. So you get this really ethereal bit coming out of the right ear. So let me just do this. Let me mute this. Well, let me solo this and mute this. And then let me make this pre-fader. And then we can just hear the effect sound. Right, it's really dark and dirty. Really like that. It goes well with the baritone guitar. So the next bit, hard work. They're going to a college event. So I'm using these Tone Hammer drum core marching ensemble. And let's take a listen to those. So I printed the snare drums out because they're really loose. And at the end here, the rhythm was really off. So I did a little playing around to get it, the timing a little bit tighter by moving things a bit. And that sounds with the rest of the uh, track. Let's take a listen. A really simple pattern in the spiccato low strings. And then I've doubled this. And then there's a little. Bartok pits is right there. And the other, other thing too is I've got these aperture spiccato right here. And that sounds great. But I want it to be a little bit more edgy. So I use the Spitfire London cello to layer on top of that. a little bit more of the bow. And I've also kept this emphasis, this EQ, which I used in the last video on act one, just to get us more edge. So when you layer these two together, and then when I change sections, I change the orchestration. The drum beat changes. Low notes are now in the low winds, and I've got this pizzicato, the Bartok pits, just giving us a pedal point. And then right in here, I don't know how long this section is, the green up here, because that hasn't been done yet. So when that gets done, that's going to be inserted, which means that I'm going to have to move all the stuff to the right here further down the timeline. And I might have to extend this or write some music under there. But this is where we are right now. And the next section, uplifting things are good. Let's take a listen to what that is. 
And this is something from the first act. I had this very feel, this theme in three sections in the first act. This time though, I've changed it a little bit by adding these pizzicatos. And that goes with this here. I prepare you for those subdivisions of those eighth note groups of three and two. Right at the very beginning of the piece in the teaser, when this section comes in, da 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 da, da. And then when we have the seven eight section, right? We've got da 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 We've got threes and twos. So these are the kinds of things that give you a through line in your score. And got our harmonics. Drums. And then right here, instead of going to the four chord like the original, I changed the orchestration to this Copeland-esque little section here. And more raucous college sports, marching band stuff. Again with the drum core. Right, you could see them walking around with the sousaphones and all the big tubas and all that stuff, blowing this stuff out. But again, it's not in the area where the dialogue is, so you'll be able to hear this music. And they really like this section. And then something changes here. Keep the bass going, keep it moving. And the whole orchestration changes here and see how it changes the entire feel. Beautiful choir coming in there. At this point in act two, we're starting to get into some of the more intense emotional stuff. As you could see from my notes here, ethereal and dark, but not overbearing. Later on in this act, it'll get much more intense. Coincidentally, at the same time, Spitfire Audio released the Symphonic Motion String Library, which I then purchased because I thought it would be really good to use on this cue. Right now, I have just have Sultasto straight eighth notes all the way across. One other thing I did to make this really smooth and with a nice wash, I made a very slow attack and I added some to the release so that you get a slower attack, it's gentler, it's more ethereal, and the release lets the sound overlap to the next eighth note a little bit. This is a variation, an expansion on the melody at the very opening of the film. And I've changed it here, and you could see the descending line here in C minor. Got the Celtic voice from Heaviosity here. Here comes the melody from the opening. Very gentle, very ethereal. Very impressionistic almost, like you'd really have to think about it to put that together with the opening, but it's there. Kind of cool thing I did here, I've got this solo cello. And what I've done is I've taken the cello legato and I've also added the first desk legato violin. So let's listen to that in the track. And here we come in. Just swells in. And then the LCO textures come in.
let's listen to this LCO textures. Playing that melody. And this is a really cool figure in the piano, arpeggio. I'm sorry for the crazy Pro Tools notation. Actually, minor 11th, it goes up to that B flat. But right here, you could see a minor 9th. And this is using the kinds of voicings that I went over in my last intervallic harmony video. So you can see that I actually use these things that I show you. Going down to E flat, minor ninth, even though it ends up on this F minor here. This is F minor with the seventh in the bass, okay? It's very ethereal, and then go out of the key a little bit to this D suspended chord or C triad over the D in the low end. Low drum hits. And this is an F minor with the second in it, right? So this is, again, my intervallic chord voicings. I've got a sixth below a fourth. So I've got A flat to F and then G up to C. I have the adaptive verb now on. It's really a CPU hog, and I've got a fairly low buffer setting. So this is just moving to a sort of cadence area here. F cadence, right. We've got that buzzy low sound again. LCO textures. Very ethereal. Okay, and then the symphonic motion strings come back in with just a bass note, these low drum hits, and then continuing on with that piano figure. Take a look at some of these chord voicings in the choir. Okay, so you could see that these are three note incomplete chords. So this is the upper structure of an F minor ninth chord. You could think of it that way. You've got this, the G, which would be the ninth. The A flat would be the minor third and the E flat would be the minor seventh. And then here you've got F, C and D flat. That could be an upper structure for a bunch of chords. This could be the ninth of an E flat minor chord, the 13th or the sixth, and then the minor third. And then right here is F, G flat. It says F sharp, but it's G flat and D flat. That's the ninth, the third, and this flat seventh of um, E flat minor chord. So I gave it to you in a little bit more of an impressionistic fashion at the beginning of this cue, and now I've made it come in quicker. So in other words, instead of it taking four measures, it now takes one measure to get through the melody or the little fragment, the melodic fragment. So these are the kinds of compositional things I prepare and then deliver. And I like this right here, the orchestration here. I've got the ocarina.
and that's above the symphonic motions. So that's a look at this week's work. Again, if you've liked this video, give a thumbs up. For more content, please subscribe, and to be notified, ring that bell. As I said earlier, leave any comments or questions below. I've been Pete Calandra. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one.